And um, so what Ivan now has, has managed to do, and that is what he will share with us today, which I think is very exciting. So actually, also yesterday I mentioned it, like 60, 70 percent of the neuron volume in your brain is, is in the cerebellum. So this is definitely an important structure. But models of the cerebellum, also the physiology of the cerebellum, is sort of lagging behind in terms of the tension it receives compared to other brain structures like neocortex. So even though in neural volume, you could call it the most important part of the brain, in terms of a real fundamental understanding of it, we have not made a lot of progress. And I think even now we reach a stage that you can really claim, okay, now we have one comprehensive insight in what this structure does. There are, of course, many mysteries still around it that, that he's going to also point out to us. But I think it's really great that we have Ivan here. He will give us an overview a bit of, of the cerebellum, its role in behavior, but in particular then how we understand this, this intricate structure from a more formal uh, and theoretical perspective. Ivan, please. So thanks, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, should I turn this on? Well, um, Okay, here. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about the cerebellum, and if that topic is new for some of you, uh, at least one thing that you will probably get from, well, I would like you to get from this minimal thing from this presentation is that the cerebellum has a beautiful anatomy. Okay, so these are uh, drawings from Ramon y Cajal, the Spanish neuro neuroscientist, uh, 100 year old, so drawings by hand. And what we see here is the structure of the cerebellar cortex. Okay, so before going into the anatomy, um, why is the why is the cerebellum important? So in motor control, we know that the cerebellum makes very precise movements possible. Uh, all vertebrates have cerebellum, and this is the case of an owl. And in this Example, the owl is, uh, the, the, the cerebellum of the owl is helping, helping it to stabilize the head. It's probably with the goal of stabilizing the gaze, but this reflex, it's driven by the vestibular system. It's called the vestibulo colic reflex. And you will see now how, even with eyes closed, okay, this, this owl uh, maintains very well uh, head stability. So this like very precise, very fine-tuned motor control is like one of the hallmarks of, uh, of cerebellar function. Uh, on, the other, on, the other, on the other side, on the other hand, we have the, sorry. So we have what happens when the cerebellum is not there. And this is a person who had a, a traumatic or stroke into his uh, left side, left, the left cerebellar hemisphere. And since the cerebellum is ipsilateral, only the left side of his body would be affected. Okay, so here you see that the, the task was simply pointing forward and touching the tip of the nose. And you see here how uh, damage to the cerebellum uh, makes even this really simple uh, behavior uh, like uh, complicated and effortful. In, in the other ways it was effortless with cerebellum, most of the movements are like uh, uh, subconsciously very well coordinated. Without cerebellum, people with cerebellar uh, problems, they, they cannot move in that effortless manner. So, first a little bit of the background, and I'll start with the cerebellar anatomy. This is, these are drawings of the cerebellum, and the cerebellum, uh, it's, you saw it yesterday in, in Paul's presentation, it's located in the lower back part of the brain, it uh, takes like 10% of the brain volume, but it has more than 50% of the, of the cells. More than 50% of the cells in the brain are in the cerebellum. And I think the estimate is increasing. Now it's like 80% of the cells in the brain are in the cerebellum. That's because they are very, very small cells that are granule cells, which are most of them. So most of the cells here in number are granule cells. In volume, not, because they are very small, okay? And one characteristic of the cerebellum is that it has a very uniform structure. So in, in cerebral cortex, so in, cor in what people understand as cortex usually, uh, the histology of the, of, of the different regions is, very, is different and people identify regions based on histology. And in the cerebellum, it doesn't seem to be the case. So the same structure, the same cerebral microcircuit 
is uh, repeated, is found repeatedly through all the cerebellum. So it appears as if whatever uh, computation the cerebellum is doing, uh, is doing the same computation all over. So probably uh, in parallel, okay, but uh, there is a, a we expect a high amount of similarity in the, in the computation, so that different areas of the cerebellum are not going to perform different computations. But the function is going to be dependent on how the cerebellum is wired to, to the rest of the brain or to the upstream or downstream structures. So, cerebellum has a very well-defined anatomy, so ne ne neural anatomy. And uh, so, histologically, it's divided in three layers. Um, this is the granular layer where the granule cells are. And these are granule cells. These small, the, the small cells with uh, uh, very few dendrites, like three, four dendrites. So they contact uh, uh, just three, four uh, incoming fibers. There's the, the other layer is called the Purkinje cell layer. Okay, sorry. The Purkinje cell layer where you find the, the, the soma, so the bodies of the Purkinje cells. And Purkinje cells are the main cells of the cerebellar cortex, okay, that send their uh, dendrites upwards to the surface. So here is the surface, here is the inner part, and uh, to what it's called the molecular layer. Okay, so the, there is, um, the input pathways are also very well defined. So we know that there is one input pathway that is called the MOSI fiber pathway where these MOSI fibers call, uh, contact the, the granule cells. Granule cells there are inhibited by Golgi cells or excited Golgi cells receive reciprocal well, feedback inhibition, also feed forward inhibition. But the point is that information enters here, the cerebellum, through the MOSI fibers. It goes up through the axons of the granule cells. And this, the axons of the granule cells go just uh, directly uh, upward towards the surface and then they divide in a T shape, okay, so they go up and then they go like this, okay, parallel to the surface and parallel between all of them. So very organized system of information transmission and then they cross the dendrites of the parallel fibers, okay, so then the information of the MOSI fibers that goes to the granule cells, parallel fibers, it's integrated in the Purkinje cells. And this is one information pathway. One characteristic of this pathway is that Purkinje cells get like 100,000 contacts of parallel fibers. So there's a lot of parallel fibers content, contacting each Purkinje cell. Okay. But there is another, another pathway, which is the climbing fiber pathway. These climbing fibers are fibers that come from an extracerebellar structure that's called inferior olive. And it's an important structure because if there is an inferior olive, the structure is not the cerebellum. So to define something as the cerebellum, it, it means also that it's attached to the inferior olive. Okay, so these climbing fibers that come through the inferior olive contact also Purkinje cells, but they do it in a completely opposite manner than parallel fibers. So whereas you had 100,000 parallel fibers contacting one Purkinje cell, you just have one climbing fiber contacting each Purkinje cell. Contacting each Purkinje cell like 10,000 times at different places of the Purkinje cell, but it's just one climbing fiber. So you have massive convergence of information through the parallel fibers to the Purkinje cell, just one signal to each Purkinje cell. And the other nice thing of the cerebellum is that, well, of the cerebellar cortex, concretely, is that then there is only one output pathway, which are the axons of the Purkinje cells, and then go through the cerebellar nuclei. One, one detail is that these Purkinje cells are inhibitory cells, so they are, they are tonically active, they don't need presynaptic input to fire spikes, okay? And they are tonically inhibiting the deep nucleus, which are the target, their, their, their targets. So in order to produce an output from the deep nucleus, that then it's the output structure of the cerebellum, they release inhibition. So they, they control the output through this inhibition, no, not through excitation, but by removing inhibition. This is another, another diagram of the cerebellar cortex, where you see like that the orthogonal arrangement, so like the dendritic trees of Purkinje cells are flat, are like this. The parallel fibers that come from the cyan granule cells go up. They make this T shape. Here you see these points that are like 
parallel fibers axons crossing, parallel fibers crossing this section, and here they contact the Purkinje cells. There are a few more types of cells in the cerebellum, but cerebral cortex, but it's not Im important at this point. Just to emphasize a little bit more on the anatomy, you, you have very distinct uh, types of cells. So these Purkinje cells have like 100,000, 200,000 uh, synaptic contacts in the human brain. Granule cells have three to four. They, so they contact like three to four incoming MOSI fibers. These are the cells that we were saying that most, if you, by number, most of the cells in your brain are, are these cerebellar granule cells. Okay, so this is, these cells constitute a massive space of input through the Purkinje cells. Okay, and if you're interested, the, this particular anatomy uh, rapidly triggered like theoretical interpretations of function of the cerebellum. And I would say that what I'm going to, to, to explain you, there's of course some advances, but you will get a lot of the intuition of what is the cerebellum doing just by reading the, this book in 1967 by Eccles, Itwan, Sengatutai, that were the anatomies that really uh, 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 described with electron microscopy the, the structure of the cerebellum. So ju just to show you, this is electron microscopy of the Purkinje cells that are filled with fluorescent, uh, fluorescent dye. And you see like how as they rotate the image, uh, at some point you see completely the dendritity, and at some other you just see this these like lines. Okay, so they are very special um, neurons. I don't think you see anywhere in the brain you have this like very spe specialized uh, shape of the dendritic tree. So, so parallel fibers would be like this. Climbing fibers, which I haven't mentioned, would go in the orthogonal direction. So climbing fibers will go in this direction. Climbing fibers in this direction, parallel fibers in this direction. So. The, the parallel fiber and the climbing fiber pathway are also orthogonal. So th there's a lot of like very engineered uh, organization of the information trans transmission in the, in, the, in the cerebellar cortex. So what was the cerebellar learning hypothesis that, as you see, dates back to the late 60s, early 70s by David Marr, uh, Albus and, and Ito. So the cerebellar learning hypothesis, which is an hypothesis that probably you would have come with, uh, if you look at this uh, long enough, and you know about perceptrons or neural networks or this kind of uh, computing devices, is that we have one information pathway, which are the parallel fibers, okay, very diverse. It presents a rich variety of inputs to the Purkinje cells. You have a very specific uh, input through one climbing fiber and then one axon. And then the interpretation is that what they predicted is that the coincidence of parallel fiber activity with climbing fiber activity will drive plasticity in the synapses and change the output of Purkinje cells, which more, 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 more precisely means that uh, we should interpret that climbing fibers teach Purkinje cells which information to store in the synapses. Okay, so I don't know if you are familiar with machine learning, this uh, is what, this would be a biological inter, in implementation of a, the, the principle of supervised learning. Okay, in supervised learning, you have a function that tells you what, which is the target. This function tells you which is the error in the target. And then it adjusts the computation of the, of the Purkinje cell such that this error will be, will be uh, removed. Okay, so that was about, uh, about anatomy. Now the other part is uh, the, the the talk is a theory of cerebellar and anticipatory control. So now, a little bit of anticipatory behavior. And for, for this, I need to uh, bother Paul. Paul, can you act as a knife subject? So first, we, we will see a non-anticipatory behavior. OK, so your task is to maintain the forearm as uh, horizontal as possible. OK. OK, OK, good. Okay, so maybe you have seen that it went up. Okay, it's, it has good feedback control, but <laughs> it could be in some subjects it is worse. 
Okay, now now you do it. You remove the, you I remove the myself. yeah with the other with the other hand. You can remove the book and the same task. Okay, believe me, uh, I've made the the the, the measurements. Mm -hmm. It has been much more precise in in the second time. Okay, mm -hmm. well I don't know. Now the second time normally it doesn't work as good. So this is one, and now you yourself. Okay. So the point is that that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so, the point is that here the, the, the two examples were feedback and feed forward. And feed forward means an anticipatory. So, if you, if you don't know when the, when the book is going to be released, uh, all you do is react to the error on your task. Okay? And that, that's called feedback control because you react to the error and you act and, and then you try to minimize the error. Your reactions minimize the error. If you do it yourself, okay, you know exactly when the, when the thing is going to be removed, so you don't have to wait to the error. You can anticipate part of the error and act. Okay? So this is, this is the distinction between feed forward and anticipatory control. And in, in, in animals and humans, anticipatory control is very important because feedback is not as good as, as we might think. So this is, uh, this is the same the same uh, experiment, but in a more uh, professional setup. So it is the same task. Okay, it's the same task. So the, the task is to maintain the, uh, the ang angle in the elbow constant. Okay, but there are two different setups. In one, uh, an external uh, an experimenter will activate uh, a system that will release the weight. So they, they are fighting against some weight, and then uh, they, they're going to be released by someone else's. Or in the other case, they will themselves activate this system, and then the weight will be released in that moment. And here you see the difference. This is, this is the position of the elbow, and the vertical line indicates the, 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 the point in time in which the, the weight is, is uh, released. And you can see that there is this, 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 this is the error in the behavior. So perfect behavior would, would have been that this line uh, stays perfectly uh, constant, but there is this deviation that it afterwards is a little bit minimized. So here in a, in a voluntary unloading, you see that the, the error or the, the effect of the disturbance, would, we would say in control theory terms, is much lower. And this is not a learning task. So it's just one shot, one shot of every, every, of every task, different subjects. Okay, so this is about the behavior. If we look about the control signals, okay, here they, they record the EMG of the brachio, brachioradialis. So it's, it's one, one muscle that keeps, makes, uh, it's an agonist muscle of, the, of this joint, so that it, it, you activate it when you close the, the elbow. And this is the, the EMG, so since here you have less weight, you should act less, you should activate less this, this muscle. So here you see that there is the, the time when the object is released, and then there is a deactivation with a certain latency of, of this, so less EMG activity. This is in the case where the, the, the particular moment of this is non-predictive. Okay, I will, I will put the reference, well, if, I'm sorry I, I didn't put the reference into the slide. If you're interested, ask me. I will tell you which is. Uh, in, the, in the voluntary unloading, the time is known, okay? And, and this EMG here is of the other arm. And the change in the EMG, it means that the subject is actuating the, the, the mechanism, okay? So you can see, like, now, the, the, the activation of the fore of, of the muscle precedes slightly the onset of the, of the, of the change, okay? And if you compare to the, to the initial response, it, it, it precedes this feedback response even by a higher, uh, larger extent, okay? So in a very naive, simple way, uh, we, we can, uh, we think of this behavior as one anticipation of the reflex before the stimulus. Somehow, this, the, we like to think about these behaviors that, in, that somehow reflect that 
a reflex what was triggered by the stimulus, now it's triggered by some predictive signal. Okay, and this is the approach that we're going to follow. So this is another example of an anticipatory behavior, and in this case it's a learned behavior. So this is eyeblink conditioning, and by the way, these slides are by a collaborator, well, by Gary Heslow in Loon, which is uh, uh, the, I mean, world expert in eyeblink conditioning, who do, with whom we collaborate, and Ricardo Zucca here has worked with him in his lab. And if you ever had the chance to assist to a presentation by Gary, he's uh, the clearest person explaining uh, cerebellum and... Uh, and he's in our BCBT... Uh, and he's been in BCBT, I think, three times, maybe. So, eyeblink conditioning. Let's see how... So, in eyeblink conditioning, first, the, 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 the stimulus, sorry, goes like this. So you will see that this uh, indicates that a sound is delivered to the, to the subject, and this blue indicates the period during which the, the, the sound is, is delivered, and at the termination of the sound, an air path is also sent to the eye, and the subject uh, re re reacts to this air path with a blink. Okay, so this, this trace here indicates the closure of the of the eye, and this indicates the EMG. So you can either measure the behavior or measure the, 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 the control signal of the behavior. So initially you have the sound, sound stops, air path, and blink. So if this is repeated uh, in, in, um, after 15, 20 trials, you will observe this. The sound, the blink, and the air path. So now the blink will precede the air path. So uh, the, the subject would have learned to associate the, the, the sound with the, with the air path that's coming, so that now the blinking will anticipate instead of uh, follow the, the, the stimulus. So, well, by the way, the, this, this is Pavlovian conditioning. This is in concretely is condi classical conditioning of the Alvin reflex, and maybe if you are familiar with the terminology, you have the conditioning a stimulus, which is the, 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 the stimulus that initially has no value, okay, but that through, through the conditioning session would be associated with the unconditioned stimulus. And then conditioned stimulus is the one that triggers a reactive reflex. Okay, so the point we know that, let's see here, yeah, we know that this happens in the cerebellum, and you might, even, you might think that this is a simple task, so you learn that this thing it, it's, it's not necessarily a task that requires awareness. So you can get conditioned with, without even knowing that you are conditioned, and a coma patient can get conditioned. So it's something that works, can work autonomously. You don't have to think about the stimuli. Well, besides that, besides being a very simple learning paradigm, we know also that it's a cerebellar learning paradigm. So we know that learning and eyeblink conditioning occurs in the cerebellum, that the cerebellum is crucial for that, and we know very well the neuroanatomy the, so the, the input pathways where these stimuli reach the cerebellum and how they, they, they uh, coincide or yeah, meet in the, in the cerebellar cortex. So for instance, the CS, which CS in here was sound, but you can use a CS uh, image or uh, tactile stimuli or other kind of stimuli. It's not a modality fixed. So, but in this case, if we consider sound as the CS, it will go through the vestibulocochlear nuclei, through the pontine nucleus, through the pontine nuclei, and through the pontine nuclei, uh, it will send mossy fibers to the brain, then contact the granule cells, these cells that there are so many, and reach the Purkinje cells. Okay, so this part here is the cerebellar cortex, so it's where, where you should be looking more at, it's the more important. This is for the CS. For the US, regarding the pathways that, that, that go to the cerebellum, it doesn't mean that the US will only follow this pathway. It will go also to other parts of the brain, to the amygdala, etc. So regarding the US, it, to get to the cerebellum, it goes to the trigeminal nuclei, nucleus, then to the inferior olivari nucleus, and this inferior olivari is already connected to the cerebellum, send these axons that become the climbing fibers and in here you can see how the climbing fiber is wrapped along the, the, the body of the Purkinje cell. So here you can see how the CS and the US signals uh, 
uh, meet in the, in, the, in the cerebellar cortex, at individual Purkinje cells. So, and then the output of the Purkinje cells, the axons go through the, to the interpositus nucleus, that it's a nu nuclear structure of the cerebellum, and through this, it travels through, through two bra brainstem nuclei and triggers the eye blink reflex. Okay. So, if we, are, we map this into what was the cerebellar linking hypothesis, we have the, sear, the sound, the air path, and the blink. And this is work from Gary Heslow's group, uh, in which they show how after learning, these Purkinje cells respond to the, to, the, to the CS. So initially, this is the period of the CS is marked here. So these Purkinje cells have high sustained activity. They are firing uh, actions, simple spikes or action potentials continuously. And initially, they will, re they will not respond to the CS, so they will continue firing. But after, in this case, these experiments are done with the celebrate ferrets. It's a long and painful experiment to do for everyone. Well, the ferrets are, are decelerated, so not for them, but uh, also for the experimenters. And in a few hundred trials, it takes long in this case, uh, what you would observe is that there is a drop in activity of the Purkinje cell uh, that anticipates the US. Okay, this is a 300 CSUS interval, and you see like the drop in activity. So this drop will release inhibition from the cerebellar nuclei. The cerebellar nuclei then would fire more and will drive the other nuclei that will drive, cause the blink. And here you see also that for different, different uh, CSUS, so different intervals between the sound and the air path, the cells will have a different profile of the pose. So it's related to the, it's related to the interstimulus interval. So these cells, they not only learn that they have to blink, they also learn how to blink. So it's an associative and uh, so the cerebellum implements an associative memory, but uh, also precise in time. So that, that was all introductory, okay. But looking at this is the, the questions that we start to ask on very theoretical high level are like, what does the cerebellum learn to anticipate? Does it learn about the action or about the stimulus? So if you read the literature, you would, you, you would see that the, the, the Purkinje cell, uh, the output of the Purkinje cell is the condition response, no? codes the condition response. So you, you should in, probably will interpret this, that the output of the Purkinje cell then it's an, it's an action. So the cerebellum is sending uh, motor commands. Okay, but also if you read the historical literature of animal, animal learning, people were debating here, what's, what, what's the, what, what is learn? It's a stimulus response association. So you, you learn to associate the sound with blinking or it's a stimulus, a stimulus association. Do you, you learn to associate the sound with the air path and then the air path triggers the blink. So it, it's, it seems like a trivial thing or not very important thing, uh, like a, a metaphysical debate more or less, but I will try to convince you that it has important implications. So what, if any, difference would it make learning motor actions or advancing stimuli? Okay, so going back to uh, eye blink conditioning, this case in rabbits, this is, this is the complete, so this is a scheme taken from the literature or of the complete anatomy of the eye blink circuitry. The difference with the one that I showed before is that here you have this link here that is not through the cerebellum, that it's the one that maps the US into a blink. So normal arrows means information, like a stimulus enters the brain, another a motor command is executed. These arrows with inverted ends, endings are uh, synaptic contacts, okay? So the point is that we have this arc here that acts as a reflex. So it's the one that, that converts the sound uh, the air path in a blink since the beginning, and this other here uh, is where the where the U CS and the US converge, and then through learning will then uh, acquire a response. Okay. So if if you look at this, we made the, the the decision to model it in this manner in in 
in control theory terms. So the, this, now there will be a little bit of uh, control theory terminology. So the eye blink, the act of blinking the eye, uh, the thing that is controlling control theory, it's called the plant. So this P here would be like the eyelids, so the, the object controlled by the cerebellum. C is a feedback controller. So it's a, this controller that only reacts to the errors. And in this case, it's, it's the, the controller that initially just converts this averse stimulus, an air path, into a blink. Okay, so initially, if there is no, no learning, you just go through this, through this inner loop. Okay, and then this is, this is, this is the feedback control system, and the, feed, the controller and the plan, they are called the closed loop system. Okay, so you can consider of the, the controller and the eyeblings as just one system, and it's called the feedback control, the, the feedback closed loop system. And on top of it, we put the cerebellum. And then the, the, the cerebellum uh, gets information that a priori doesn't have to be associated with any air path, like sound, light, and it also gets the error information, okay, the, 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 the US. And then through learning, it will acquire an output, and importantly, the, we say that this output will drive the feedback controller. This output is not going to act directly on the plant, okay? So by, by doing, drawing this like this, we're saying that the output of the cerebellum is not a motor signal. It's a sensory signal that drives a controller that then produces a motor signal, okay? But you see that this is like a very direct interpretation of the anatomy, okay, that we have made. And then I will just, uh, this was about the architecture. So what about the learning? What's, what's the learning mechanism, no? And we start to model this at the most abstract uh, uh, level, okay? So it's a repetitive uh, trial. And now here, maybe it's useful to forget Evelyn conditioning. And now think of, for instance, self-balancing robots and velocity, okay? Think that this is, or robots and velocity. Think that this is the velocity signal. This is called the reference signal. The reference signal enters the system. This is the goal of the behavior. You want a robot that stays stable, stays still, and then moves at a certain velocity, and then stops again, okay? And this is the signal that enters the whole system, okay? Initially, here, this, the cerebellum doesn't know anything about this, so it will have no output. You, you just will control, uh, you, you will just get behavior through the feedback controller, and say that this is the, the behavior that you get. Say that there is some delay in the response, and then the response is not perfect, so think of Paul moving the, a little bit the arm. So this would be like the feedback response. You see that the, the signals are color-coded with, with this skin. So our man, minimal hypothesis of what should the cerebellum do in order to learn is that the cerebellum will just take this error signal that it gets it here and move it forward in time. And then at the next repetition of the same thing, just send it. No? You, you are in the next trial, you are doing this repetitively through loops. So the next time you, you, you have to perform the same, the same task, but now you will be helped by the cerebellum sending you this anticipatory signal, okay? And this signal will enter the feedback controller as if it was an error. So we call it counterfactual error because it's not, it doesn't code any error that it's happening now or that it's going to happen. It's just a signal that's been learned from errors and that, uh, that for the feedback controller is it identical to an error. You can also sum these two signals, R and O, and then you have like a reference that is the reference that we would make the controller to follow. So this is the, the we will cheat and say, like, uh, make the controller follow this reference in order that it manages to follow this accurately, okay? Let's see if it becomes a little bit clearer. Okay, this signal is not there because it's not present. It's the, the sum of R plus O, okay? But because this is commutative, it doesn't matter if, if you make R minus E plus O or R plus O minus E. This is the input that the, this is the aggregated input that the, the, the closed loop system gets. Okay, so in trial one, just by getting this signal from the cerebellum plus uh, the feedback controller reacting to errors, you get this output. 
So you see that this was the output in the previous trial. Now the, the, the error has become a little bit less. Well, it's become less, smaller in amplitude, because now the, the response is not lagging the, the, the reference. It's, it's like well-timed, but still not perfect. So there's some error. And now the, to, to complete the, the, the learning algorithm, what you do is you take this error signal, shift it forward in time, and add it to the previous one, to the previous foot forward command. So that way you are updating the feed forward command. Now this is the new predictive signal. This is the signal you would use. This is the new output. And if you keep doing this, you see by 10 trials, there is a very important decrease in error. And at 50 trials, the, the, the system has converged to the perfect behavior. So this is like a, a, an, in, a, an intuition of uh, how this algorithm works. So now this, this part is going to be a bit more formal, mathematically. So we just model this, okay? We model in discrete time. This is the architecture. Uh, well, this is the cerebellum. Also here it's like fit forward module. Because in itself, this architecture can, is not particular to the cerebellum. You can use it also uh, in other tasks. And the point is that uh, if you know a little about dynamical systems, that probably you don't know. The, the, the thing is that you can uh, express this system, or which is a discrete time linear, uh, dynamical system. You can uh, describe it with the dynamics and the input and the output matrix. So say that this, this is this plant. Say that this is the eye, or the arm. Okay. This is the motor neurons that control the arm and or the eye. Okay. So. Together, you, can, you could describe the state of this system. You, you could say that the, the eye is in that angular position and motor neurons are tonically firing at that, pos at, at that, at that rate. Okay? So this would be the state of this system. And the state would be this x, x of n. So we could describe the state of, of this system at different time steps. Okay? So given this architecture, what we know is that uh, then we can, we can model the time-to-time -time, uh, evolution of the state of the system, so the eyelid closure, for instance, with what is called a dynamics matrix that says how the next state depends on the previous state and on the inputs to the system. And in the inputs on the system are, this is like the US, for instance, and N is time step, and this is this predictive signal, in this case the output of the cerebellum. And then here we can get the, the real output signal, that in this case it would be like uh, the position of the eye. Okay, so this is time, uh, time step wise modeling. The point is I, if this is repetitive tasks, so all trials have the same duration, I can compact everything into vectors, and I will not go into details into this. But the point is that I can summarize the whole dynamics of the, of the behavior in one trial just with one, with one function, with one matrix. Okay, and then now if I take this, this input, this external input which is constant, so every trial I get the same, the same US or every trial I want to follow the same trajectory, um, I can model just uh, each trial, I can simulate each trial in one, time, in, in, in one operation. Okay? This means that uh, I'm getting like a compact uh, uh, formulation of, of to compute behavior in one trial. Okay? So now the, the only thing I need to do to this description is to add learning. Okay? This is just to simulate how the system reacts to the inputs. No, I want to put learning. Okay? So this you remember, we say that this would be like the climbing fibers of the cerebellum. This is the error signal that gets to the, to, the, to the cerebellum. And learning, this operation that I showed before of shifting in time and adding or scaling, scaling as well, is modeled like this. It says that the, in order to generate the, the, the output signal for the, next for the next trial, what you do is you take the error signal of this trial you shift it in time. This is what this operation does. It shifts by delta time steps. 
you scale it and you add it to your previous output signal. Okay, this is the way you formalize what I put in that diagram before. Okay, so th the rule, if you have to describe it, is anticipate the error, scale it, so anticipate it with this, scale it with this, add it to the previous fit forward or predictive signal, and this is what you have learned from one trial for the next. Okay, the point is now I can plug, I can plug this, this, uh, so I can plug the description of the, of the system into this learning rule and I get what it's called a linear dynamical system in which I can simulate, I can simulate learning. Okay, so it becomes a, like a concise uh, description of the linear, of the learning algorithm, but now the learning algorithm is, is transformed into a dynamical system. So what, what's the use of it? Okay, now this, this is probably the most uh, mathematically complex to follow part, but say that this, these equations here are modeling a plant. So you have to use your, your imagination here. And it says that, uh, say like this is the, the, the velocity of a robot, okay? So it says that the velocity of this robot in the next time step is going to be the velocity it has now multiplied by some factor. It's, uh, it means that this robot, this factor is less than one, it means this robot, it, it has no input, it will slow, uh, lose velocity and, and re remain still. And this is the input, so the, the input signal we're giving to the robot, okay, like the power to the motors. But there is a, n, the, this n minus one, minus one, means that there is a delay in the transmission, so it doesn't take directly the signal now, it takes the signal of one time step before. And then these are, this is the way we compute the, the power to the motors. Okay, it, and it's multiplying by the current error and adding another term that I will not explain now, it's an integral term. I don't know if anyone here knows about PI control, PID control, these things. This is a PID controller. So the point is that you have this system, you can express it in these matrices that I shown before, and then you can do like, so with this, now if you give numbers to these parameters, you can study this system. So and by studying the system, you will learn how this learning, so you will see how this learning algorithm would work. So say I put these values, these to the parameters, so these are the values of the, of the physical system, like of the robot and the controller of the robot, and eta and delta are the, are the parameters of the learning device, like of, of the learning algorithm, okay? And what I'm going to try is different parameters for the anticipation, so it's how much I have to shift the parameter, because you will see that this is like the crucial, crucial thing, crucial parameter. So this is what is called a stability analysis. So it means, what it means is that you can take the system and ask MATLAB to give you the eigenvalues of the system, which is some, some complicated uh, or not so complicated uh, linear dynamical system concept. And just by looking at this, if you see some of these eigenvalues that have a magnitude greater than one, it means that the system is unstable. So it will go to infinite. It means that it's a bad configuration, the, the, the system will not learn. But if all values are less than one, it means that this system will converge. And converging in this case means that learning will get some stable state, okay? You will get onto something. And this is what you get to. Okay, red is the, the initial response, so when, before learning anything, these gray traces means as learning progresses, and blue is the response after 20 trials. And the goal, you don't, it, it's in green, but you don't see it because it's concealed by the output. So it means that after 20 trials, with this configuration, delta equal to two, the system learned to, to perform, no? to output what we were uh, asking the system to. This is the evolution of the error with trials. And then this is interesting. This is, this is what has the cerebellum learned in particular here, okay? And what it has learned is the signal that anticipates the reference and it, it moves the feedback controller to the right, the output of the feedback controller to the right place in everyone. So, okay. So things that we see here is that, well, the system converges, but it, it just converts to, the, to one parameter anticipatory. So it seems that you have to know how to set this parameter 
and at the end it converts perfectly. But what is this signal? So what it means this signal? So can we can so can we a priori say what is the cerebellum should learn then given this? And if we do some analysis, what it's interesting of this uh, of this system, we can we can analytically solve for the fixed point, and the fixed point has this this shape. This means th this is the error of the feedback. This is how bad the so without any learning, how good or bad was I performing? And this is the error of the system. So the feedback, the feedback, uh, the feed forward command, so what the cerebellum has learned is just a signal that would produce as output the error. So that if you will add it to the original signal, you will get perfect performance. It means that in this case, the cerebellum, the only thing it learns is to correct, correct the feedback response. Yes. So you have good feedback, uh, good feedback control, it learns little. You have bad feedback control, it has to learn a lot. Okay, it has to learn a strong signal. And this is just the, the demonstration that if you put this solution into here, you get that the output of the system, it's the reference. So that the output, the system has converged to what you wanted, the system. So the fit forward signal removes the error of the output. Okay. So, th so far so good, you might think that it's, th this is my hobby project or that uh, this guy is doing some peculiar things, so very original. So, okay. There's a, an alternative hypothesis in the, in the literature, and this is the Kawato's feedback error learning model of the cerebellum. I think it's out since the 80s, and it's important because this is, this is uh, diagrams from, his, from a review paper, this one, with Daniel Wolpert and Chris Mayall, so very important motor control uh, people, and I think this is where he proposed the model. So, this is very similar to what I have been uh, showing you. The only difference is that this guy here that plays the role of the cerebellum, instead of getting as error the input to the controller, gets as well a stitching signal. The input of the controller gets a stitching signal. The output of the controller. Okay, that's it. So uh, he says this. I just said the opposite, and <coughs> that's that's a, that's the difference. <coughs> the the, the main difference. And it's important because uh, cerebral feedback error learning is very used in motor control research or in uh, the... F so it's like the hypothesis that experimental psychologists would use. So we'll try to... to is, is the one that you will see in papers when their experiments have done with humans in order to try to confirm this theory, the theory of feedback error learning in the cerebellum. Okay? So even though it has been applied also to uh, robotics, the important part is that it has some, it's, it's important within the neuroscience domain, okay? So how, how would this thing work? So now take the same uh, algorithm as before. Now you see that this is changed a little bit. Now the, the, the teaching signal comes after the cerebellum. And now I have to, I have to plot two, two graphs. This is on the sensory domain. This is the motor, the motor domain. So here you have R and Y and here you have the output of the controller and the output of the cerebellum. So this is trial one. Trial one, this was the reference, this was the performance that we obtained. Now this is the output of the feedback controller. Okay, so now let's use the same learning strategy. Take the advance, the feedback command, okay, and then in the next trial, we will just send this command, okay, and then the system is going to be driven by this command and whatever the feedback controller outputs as a result of the current error. Okay. And this is what happens after one trial. This is, this is the new feedback command. So you just shift it, add it to the previous. So I'm using just the same learning rule as before. Just the system is, is uh, slightly differently connected. Okay. And if we go on, you see that this also works. Okay, both, both worked the same way. So is there any use on what I've shown you before? Since this is what it's accepted in the theory, it seems to work the same way. So am I wasting your time? Let's see what happens. <clears throat> so this is how it was in the, in, the, in the counterfactual control. This is how we call the other, this model, the previous model. Okay, the change is just, you see, it's very slight. No, 
the same boxes and arrows, just connected a little bit differently. And now the learning signal, instead of having an E here, has a U. Okay. I would not bother you with too much with the mathematical derivation, but you can also come to a this, uh, dynamical system of this. You can also convert this learning algorithm into a dynamical system. And these are the plots of how this dynamical system uh, behaves. Okay, so this is the feedback error learning. The same analysis I did for the other model, but now with feedback error learning. Now how's the, how they compare. Uh, counterfactual predictive control with anticipatory feedback error learning model. So this is identical, this is identical, this is identical. The only difference is in the output of the cerebellum. So it means that they are surprisingly, or not surprisingly, initially surprisingly, afterwards maybe not, uh, similar. So it's not only they converge to the same, they, they do exactly the same through learning. And it doesn't depend on the characteristics of the plan or of the controller as long as they are linear, etc. Okay. So difference first. Difference is in what they learn. Okay. This architecture here, it just learns to remove the error. So it takes into account what the feedback controller is already doing, and it just changes, drives the controller a little bit to remove this error from the behavior. Okay. In this other one, uh, it's not con what, so the, the system learns the output of the feedback controller, but after it has learned, it doesn't care about the feedback controller. It just controls directly the plant. So it, it depends on the goal and the dynamics of the system. So it forgets the feedback controller. So this strategy, CFPC, uses the feedback controller both during learning and afterwards. And the feedback, on, uh, the feedback error learning strategy uses the feedback controller only for learning but it bypasses the feedback controller after learning. So the, these were the differences. What are the similarities? The similar, similarities are that for the same set of parameters of the learning system, and it's this eta and delta, so the scaling and the anticipation, this here is going to be identical. So the, the behavior is going to be identical, and also the input to the plant is going to be identical. So you and the sum of these guys is going to be identical after learning, okay? Because if the behavior is identical, the output is the same, the input has to be the same in these cases, okay? So imagine you, do, you perform an experiment, it will mean that you can get the same output, the same behavior with either of the two models, and if you record the EMG signal, you can get the, EMG, the same EMG, EMG signal. Do you know what the EMG signal is? Okay, so the same EMG signal with both models. So what are the implications of this? So the, the main indi implication is if you go through the literature, evidence that has been taken to support uh, feedback error learning can also support this counterfactual predictive control. So uh, evidence that was supported this uh, cerebellum learning the output of the feedback controller can also support the cerebellum learning the input of the feedback controller, learning about the errors and about the motor commands. And for instance, take this a uh, very recent paper, a uh, nice paper, uh, so you see April 2016, the neural feedback response to error as a teaching signal for the motor learning system. So now you'll see that there are remarkable different similarities between this and what I just presented, okay? But you take, the, take that the title of this paper says that this is uh, evidence pointing to the uh, neural the feedback response. So they use the feedback error learning as their uh, hypothesis, okay? So let me, exp I want to explain you the results, so I will explain you first the, the, the experimental protocol. This is a, these are force field, force field uh, uh, learning. So the point is that you have this manipulandum and subjects have to move from a starting point to a target and they have to do it as uh, straight as possible and fast, okay? The point is that, that this robot, besides providing you tracking, it can also actuate, so it can add forces. And in some trials, what they, uh, they are going to do is to add a force perpendicular to the trajectory and proportional to the velocity. So it means that if you want to go forward, you will, you will deviate. And then by trial by trial learning, and this is also known to depend on the cerebellum because cerebellar patients are going to be impaired in this learning, uh, you will learn just to 
counteract this uh, disturbance, so this force that keeps you away from the uh, vertical straight line and, uh, and, and perform a uh, correct, correct movement. So they do this protocol in which they have first what they call an error clamp trial. So it's a trial in which you just go forward and the system corrects for your errors. So you do a perfect trajectory. It means that if you have to, when you do this, you compensate for errors. Here there are no errors to compensate because this system, the, the robot is uh, making you have no error, okay? Then they add, they add a perturbation in one trial, okay? And then, then you see how the, the, the movement deviates from the, from the straight line is this thing here. And then you have, um, you made an error clamp trial again. And then what they do is they measure EMG. So in this trial, they get the baseline EMG, okay? Then the difference between in the EMG be between this trial and this trial, it's, it's they, they, with this, they operational, operationalize the measure of the feedback response, okay? So they see how much, uh, so what's the additional, EMG that you have because of the perturbation and in addition to the EMG that just, just corresponds to moving forward, okay? And then in the next trial, what they do is they put an error clamp trial again. So there's, there's not going to be any error and what they are going to measure is the, the forces, the perpendicular forces that they do in that trial. So the assumption is that in just one trial, these subjects would have learned to correct some of the error, okay? And then by measuring the EMG here, you can know exactly what they have learned there. So the, their feed forward, you can measure the feed forward command. And here you can measure the feedback command. So what is this? Uh, this, is, this is the error in the, in the, okay. Here they take trials in which there are two perturbations in a row so that they can, they can also measure the, the decrease in error. And you see that the error in the first trial, it's the green line, and the error in the second trial with a perturbation, the error in the second trial with a perturbation is less. So the guys are learning. And this blue line is this EMG in error clamp trials. So this is the feed forward command. So how much they have learned after one trial and after two trials, okay? This is, well, this is not the, the, the important, this is just the behavior, okay? The important thing is, what are the EMGs that they have recorded? Okay, in important is are the, the green and, and the red one, for instance. Here you see the, the feedback response to the error. So this is the EMG, the, the, the EMG that they assume is the feedback error response because it's the difference in a perturbed and unperturbed trial. Okay, and then the blue is what they, they, they say is the, um, the feed forward command that they measure just after one perturbation trial in which trial when there is no error, okay? Because of the sign of the protocol. And then if they take this, so here, look again, uh, blue is the feedback response. This is a, just an example. They, they have more mus muscles that they have recorded with EMG. So blue is the EMG of the feedback response. Uh, magenta is the the EMG of the feed forward response. And here you see that they are not uh, on time. They are also plotted in different scales. So if they shifted to align them, you see how what they have learned from error is very similar to, what, to how they have reacted through feedback. So in essence, this is confirming that this uh, formalization that we have made and this minimal assumption of how to model uh, learning trial by trial in the cerebellum is in the is, is is found is found in the experimentally so in is confirmed the point is that they here advance to a hypothesis so they, they say this confirms the shift and scale hypothesis so that the cerebellum just learns to shift and scale and it also confirms that it learns the from the feedback of the of the controller okay so yeah this we agree so I agree, these results support the shift and scale, but they cannot tell whether you have learned from the output of the feedback controller or from the input of the feedback controller. And this is what I've shown in the first part of the presentation, that these two systems were identical. So here, what we don't agree with, 
with the outcome, the, the, the discussion of this paper is that you have to interpret this as learning for the output of the feedback controller. Okay. So this is one of the important. So then, if you have to choose between the two, uh, what, what? In this counterfactual predictive control, the one that learns about the stimulus, exploits the reflexes because they, they use, it uses the reflexes, they are always in the loop. Uh, feedback error learning replaces the reflexes. Okay? It's to learn to anticipate reflexes such that they become redundant. Which strategy is better? Okay, let, let's say that so far, let's suppose there is no uh, physiology because you probably, if you record the output of the cerebellum, you could tell between the two which one it is. But if you record behavior, you cannot tell. So which one should be better? So, and I, I'm going to give you uh, evidence why you should prefer the learning from the learning sensory stimulus and using the reflexes. And this is, this evidence goes in the line that reflexes are uh, much more computationally sophisticated than what people, people assume normally. So this is an example of, of 1966, 1976 of training of a stretch reflex. The stretch reflex is a, is a reflex that if your uh, configuration, so if your muscles uh, get elongated or shortened without you, so uh, if, if the length of a muscle changes uh, uh, by, a, by, a, by an external force, uh, you react uh, reflexively to go back to the original one. No? It's a postural adjustment that, that makes you preserve the, the, the postural the posture, maintain posture. So in here they, they put these this, uh, subjects in, in a moving platform, but the platform could either displace back or tilt. Okay, this, in both cases, the movement would, would produce an el elongation of the calf muscles, and then it, this will trigger the stretch reflex, and they will measure the stretch reflex through EMG. You know? It's an old paper, 76. The point is that in this case, when, in this case, this reflex is behaviorally, it's, it's functional, so it, it's good because it keeps you balanced. But in this case, uh, if, if th this reflex uh, puts you, uh, sends, moves you backward, no? makes you lose uh, balance. And what they show is that in, in very few trials, this, that it's a reflex, that it's driven by the spinal cord, so it's, um, I think, monosynaptic or disynaptic reflex, uh, it can be retrained in four trials. So reflexes are not uh, static stereotype transformations. Okay, this is, another, this is another example of retraining of the eyelid reflex. In this case, they restrain the eyelid. I think they restrain the left lid. Okay, so the people are blinking, but they have some mechanism that makes blinking harder because they are, there's a force that opposes blink. And then they send air puffs, these people are blink. And then they remove, they remove the, the, the restraint, and then they measure the eyelid closure. So this is eyelid closure before the restraining uh, for the eyelids. This is stimulating the left eye or the right eye. The, the blinking is, uh, so even if you just stimulate one eye, you blink with both, okay? So here, but you blink more with the one that has been received the stimulus. So you see that when they link, they, they send their path to the, to the left eyelid, the, 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 the trace for the left lid uh, closes more, and when they do it on the right one, the one from the right closes more. But after they have restrained the left lid, trained and removed, you see that in both cases, the amplitude of the, of the blinking for the left lid has increased. So also here you can see how a particular uh, reflex can be trained quite rapidly. And just to show you some, uh, another example of uh, what, how reflexes are not this uh, fixed input-output transformations that we may think. In, in this uh, paper, okay, they have measured from the motor neurons that control this uh, uh, the reflex that just uh, 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 controls the ankle position, uh, flexes the ankle. And the point is that uh, they have measured previously to this that depending on the position, the same stimulus uh, to the ankle, depending on the, 
on your position will produce a higher or lower stimulation. So if your ankle is already flexed, uh, a stimulus on the, on the lower side of the, of, the, of the foot will not trigger any response, EMG, or a, a small one, because there is no way of flexing more. You can interpret this as there is no way of flexing more the ankle. But if the ankle is uh, maximally extended, uh, the, the response is going to be much higher. And here they have just measured the, the unicellular mechanism, the, 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 the mechanism that the single cell controls this. So if reflexes perform adaptive context-dependent transformation, so if they already know about the context of the body, they all know, can learn, learn by experience, why should we replicate their function? So why should we learn their output and replace them instead of using them? No? This would be a... This would be non-economic, no? it would, you would put the same, the same transformation twice in the brain. So we have just done some uh, simulations with this, okay, to simulate this in our model. So this is the previous model, and here what we do is like some restraining of the eyelid, some, something in that way. So we have changed the dynamics of the plan. We have changed one coefficient, okay, we change the coefficient, the system was already trained, and we see now how the, the, the signal acquired, uh, which, which behavior produces, both for the feedback error learning or for the CFPC. Well, interestingly, if you just change the plan, there is no difference again. So it's, uh, the similarity seems to go a, a long way, no? So if, in both strategies, if you just perturb the plan, you, you, you cannot see a difference in the behavior. However, Say that no, you now retrain the, the reflex, okay? So now that the reflex behaves as in a way that it has compensated for this change, okay? It achieves more or less the same response that it achieved before, okay? Now, finally, it comes the difference. So you, you wanted to have this output here, this, is, this is square line, and this rectangular signal, and now the output of the counterfactual controller goes much closer than just with the perturbation to the desired output, the output of the feedback error learning goes further away. So you can say that you had some perturbation to the plan, something has changed, the feedback controller has learned that, but in one architecture, the feedback error learning, that the, that the reflex learns is a bad thing, okay? That the reflex learns is a bad thing, but because then it interferes with what you have learned. In the Counterfactual one, the one that we are presenting, is a good thing because now it means that it has, it 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 will perform closely closer to what you learned knew before. Okay, so this is just what I said, and to put it a little bit more uh, in theoretical terms, what what is best about this strategy compared to this one is that it is really modular. So this controller, it's the only one that cares about the controlling the plan, this controller here, it doesn't care about the plan, it's, it, con it cares about how the, con the reflex, the, the feedback controller or the reflex control the plan. And here both systems just control the plan. So even though if drawn like this, they might seem to have the same structure, they have not. So this one is truly hierarchical, this one is parallel, it's not hierarchical. So both are acting, the adaptive and the reactive layers are acting parallel in the plan, here the adaptive layer is acting on the reactive layer. Okay, so there's a there's a hierarchical structure. So just for, for this part, now I will put some robot demonstrations of all this to wake you up. Uh, in the feedback, so even the, if the feedback error learning is dominating theory today, I think it's not going to last very much because I think it has some problems with this theory and it's and it's, it, 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 it evolved with this view that reflexes are, are, are uh, static things and then you would want to avoid them. So what, what, what is the outcome then, well, how we should interpret the con counterfactual place to control scheme, is that in this scheme, uh, anticipatory reactions are, anticipatory actions are uh, reactions to predictions. Okay, so it, it had 
an, it's not an anticipatory action directly. It's, it, it's an anticipation of an, of an event, and this event causes a reaction. And then this change of two, of two transformations uh, produces the, the reaction. So, and then it is also more if maybe you have heard of predictive coding of Bayesian inference, this example of counterfactual predictive control goes into that direction because it tells you that only at the last way of the hierarchy, at the, at the lower level, lowest level of the hierarchy, you would like to trigger action. Uh, all, all other levels would be about triggering predictions of sensory events, and then everything would be a hierarchical structure. Oh, I'm, I'm going to skip that. I don't know, how, how are we doing time? Uh, not what time much. is it? Um, well, it's 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Uh, okay, so let's go to the. Okay, so some examples of how have been applying this to robots, and this is like one that has more of a his historical value. Okay, this is so. The first thing we started doing, we started doing was like mapping. Ah, yeah. Mapping classical conditioning into into a robotic task. Okay, in classical conditioning, Eibling conditioning, you had the conditioning stimulus that was the sound, and you had the you have the unconditioned stimulus that was the error path. In this case, in this case, you, you, you had the unconditioned conditioning stimulus that are these stripes on the ground, and the unconditioned stimulus is proximity to the walls. Okay, so now in in and then the response is turning the unconditioned response. So here, in this, this would be a first trial, and here we can plot the internal signal. So we are doing electrophysiology on, on this robot. Uh, the robot doesn't care about the about the about the lines, but as soon as it sorry, as soon as it starts here, I mean, let's say, out. okay, here you see the proximity signal. No, the unconditioned response. Okay, we didn't plot the proximity signal. So this is, this is the unconditioned response. This is the response to the proximity. So you have the CS and, and nothing else. No? And then we put a learning algorithm that is close to what I have presented, but uh, a little bit more detailed. And the robot was learning. You see that we presented this in our robotics conference in IROS in 2013. See that we did the trick of instead of repositioning the robot, we repositioned the arena. So every time we rotated the arena. And you see how after learning, this uh, cerebral inspired uh, learning causes the robot, makes the robot uh, turn anticipatorily. And what we were interested in here is that we were adding some of the properties of the cortical layer so that, the, that a stronger uh, stimulus would uh, cause a earlier turn, so th which is something that you find in the cerebellum. And so what what this robot was making is uh, incrementally learn to uh, uh, turn faster and faster, and turning faster and faster was helped by this uh, generalization that it, it that it did. The robot is that if I run faster, the stimulus I get is stronger, and then I turn uh, earlier. Anyway, this, this was uh, the first, uh, maybe most straightforward mapping of this uh, cerebellar control, um, classical conditioning into robot control. But now, with, we, we are now moved into the robots and anticipatory control. And you can think of what we're doing as having an analogy with what happens in biological systems or in, for instance, in the, in the, with this kid. So if you see how this kid is walking, and you can see it as walking partly as a feedback uh, trigger behavior, it doesn't seem very steady. Okay, well, I mean, it, it has this wobbly movement. So if you would see a robot moving like this, you would think, well, oh, this robot is probably not very stable, okay? So now you see that 
he's going to lift this, this, this weight. Okay? By lifting this weight, the center of mass of the kid is going to move forward. And, and that, that, that would have to change, that would change the, the, the body configuration. So for a robot, that would be a, different, a difficult task to do. Okay. So if in a robot we have this so bad feedback control, well, so bad, this feedback control that it's not so well tuned, probably when we have this disturbance, uh, the things are going to, to, to go turn badly. But if, if you see, even if the, if the kid is not moving that dexterously, when it's about lifting the weight, it, there's absolutely no problem. So in robotics, nowadays, it would, it's going to be the, the, the reverse of this. We are going to have a robot that works like, very well, but when it's about lifting the weight, it just will fall down. Okay? Because in that case, probably, uh, the, the feedback control, um, I mean, the, the difference, the main difference is what we saw in the beginning is that there is prediction here. The, 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 the way the, the kid lifts the weight, it already configures the body uh, before uh, taking into account that somehow the, 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 the change of mass is, the center of mass is going to change. So the approach that we are taking and we are working mostly with this self-balancing robot is to improve the, the, the behavior of systems that have suboptimal feedback control. So systems that are not, have not been tuned in the control engineering department of a big polytechnic university, but that have been uh, tuned by us. Okay? And that makes suboptimal uh, feedback control directly. And why is this interesting? The point is, in nature, uh, feedback control is suboptimal mostly because of transport delays. So the time it takes between I perceive an error and I act, there are like tens of milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds. This forces you, the feedback control, to be slow, otherwise the system will be unstable. Now, in robots, is, this wasn't the case until now, but in, interestingly now, with uh, compliant robots, so robots that are flexible, uh, you don't want them to have strong feedback control because then, then they will respond aggressively. Okay. If they have strong feedback control, you move it, and even if the robot is compliant, it's going to, it's going to respond uh, strongly. So then you would lose the, the, the added value of the compliancy. Okay. And that's why, interestingly, then people are in the field, like Antonio Vicky in Pisa, for instance, they, they are saying that now with compliant robots, we will need feed forward control. Okay, and it's because we have the same thing. We have suboptimal feedback control because suboptimal, in this case, not as a bad thing, but as a robots that they are not aggressive, but then to perform well, they have to anticipate. Okay, and this is one example. Uh, this is work by by Giovanni. There is a poster outside, and uh, it's not yet submitted. But this is the perturbator. I think we mentioned it, but we, you don't have seen the video. This is again a repetitive task. This robot is balances by itself quite well in this case, and it receives an impact. And in every, every it's a repetitive task, so it will repeat receive the same impact, and the impact is cued by two stimuli. One would play the role of like sound of vision, like a distal that will precede the impact. And another one that occurs at the precise moment of the impact. Okay, without this stimulus, the only thing that the robot can do is use vestibular inform well, uh, inertial information or vestibular information to control its position. But with these uh, two predictive cues, it can uh, anticipate the, the the feedback response, and then uh, act in anticipation of the impact. So this is a, a video. So this is the robot, and this would be a disturbance. So we have like, like push the robot, and you see that uh, it stays stable, but it uh, moves a lot in the in the area. Okay. And now you will see the the setup, which is this setup to condition robots. It's like a rabbit setup, but with a robot, and with the pendulum that it's released, the robot is. Uh, well, we track the position of the robot, and when we lift it to 
put it back in the same position at the end of every trial. And uh, anyway, so okay. So this is how a trial goes. You know, it's a repetitive thing. And uh, now we will see performance in a early trial. I think this was performance in an early trial. Let's see it again. Okay, now. See this level. So this is like trial one. Here there was no prediction. This is just response. You see that it oscillates a lot. Besides, it's a little bit helped by this because when it goes too far away, it has some tension. So this is, uh, little by little, you will see that it oscillates during less time and it, it, it moves less uh, forward and backwards. This is an intermediate trial. You see that the response now has been like more aggressive. So even if the feedback response, if the feedback control is slow, because of the anticipation, it can also act like more in, a, in a more sudden manner. And this is like by the end. Okay. So we have just plugged the learning algorithm. Here we have not plugged the, the, the response. So it's like the robot has acquired the response through this anticipation of error, uh, anticipation of error signals. And if you want to know more about this, there's a poster uh, by Giovanni, I think an earlier version. Okay. Maybe we have the two at the same time now? No. Anyway. So that was one. That was uh, an example of a, a robot uh, ref, uh, rejecting an external disturbance. So something came from the from the from the world had perturbed the robot, and the robot learned to reject it. We have also now uh, studied the, the the case in which the disturbance is self-generated. For instance, you think on a self-balancing robot like this with extremities and that can lift weights uh, by changing the body position or by by grasping objects the the center of mass is going to change, and uh, if you have slow feedback control, that will produce oscillation, etc. So it's going to be good to be able to predict the, the changes. So we have presented this recently in Living Machines. This is the robot that we target to use, even though the results here are in simulation. So th this is the structure of the task. Again, a repetitive task, and what happens is that this, this robot now extends an arm, then an object is attached to the, to the, to the gripper. Uh, it holds, holds it for so a few, I don't know, second and a half, and then it's released, and then the arm is repositioned. Okay, so this is, this is now the, the, the structure of, the, of each trial in this repetitive learning. This, to show you yes, how we have modeled this, I don't, the, the, the only thing here is that it's a nonlinear system, and that if you want to simulate, you just have to type these equations into MATLAB. You don't have to understand them completely, as myself, for instance. Okay, so that it's an easy to replicate experiment. And this is the control architecture that we have used. So the plant is the robot, there is a feedback control. Here we have put two modules, but this is not important. And the point is that before the robot makes any, one, any of the movements, it will send like a motor intention signal to the cerebellum, and then the cerebellum can learn to associate these motor intentions with responses. And this is, uh, I think I already showed this yesterday, this is how the thing evolves. This in the first trial, okay, clearly suboptimal control, no, we move a little bit the arm and the weight at the end changes and the robot uh, oscillates a lot, but after just 24 trials, nothing has changed in the feedback control. It's as bad as it was in here. The only thing is that we are supplying it with uh, anticipatory signals, and you can see how, the, how it moves <laughs> in a way that it's very, very different from here, like very, very rapid responses and remains quite, quite on the same spot. So I think... In this case, the anticipatory are like the intentions of the, so at each, it's like the, so imagine, is the robot the one deciding, I'm going to extend the arm, 
I'm going to be attached to weight. So it's like the robot sends a signal like 200 milliseconds before it does it. Okay, that's the motor intention. Each motor intention has like different are like different inputs. So it's a step of the of the protocol is a different of the in the trial is a different input and then given the errors that we'll experience after this, the, the, the robot will learn then to, to to send some predictive signal that will improve performance in the same way we have done it uh, in the in the mathematical model. And in the pendulum case you just send the signal before you feed the robot. Exactly. So it's essentially for the cerebellum there's for, so for the learning algorithm itself there's absolutely no difference. Like in the diagram, the only difference is that here, this signal comes from the robot itself, from the plant. In the case of the pendulum, the signal comes from outside. It's an external stimulus. It's just that difference. Okay, but for the cerebellum, nothing's, nothing's changed. And I think that's enough. Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I don't know. I. The, the, so if I made a summary like, like right now, um, I think the take home message from this is that you can even take a, a very simple behavior like Ebling conditioning, a well-defined uh, neural anatomy, and what we have come, with, come up with is a, is a contour architecture that it's non-trivial. So even if the task initially might seem, have seemed trivial, Ebling conditioning, how, what can be simpler than Ebling conditioning in terms of learning? Um, Really, just by following the anatomy, we, we, I think we have developed a theory in which this, this uh, change, this departure from feedback error learning, what, what, that was the main theory now, is important. It's also in line with what is happening in, 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 in theories of brain function, predictive coding, etc. And I expect, or we expect, that the benefits of this to be, to be both to... to in, in, to be found in the neuroscience domain, so because we will get a better understanding of cerebral function, but also, also practical. So with the, this uh, need for anticipatory control in self-balancing robots, okay, probably it's better to think on a control strategy that would be really hierarchical, so would use fully the capacities of the lower level instead of a, of, of a, of a uh, control layer control architecture in which each layer is going to try to, to, to replace the function or improve the function of the layer before re by replacing it. That is what the feedback error learning. So even the people that are doing uh, cognitive architectures like <laughs> Paul, but I think Paul knows this, maybe it's, uh, it's important to, 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 to have this view. So what, are, what an hierarchical really, an architecture means for an architecture to be hierarchical. It doesn't mean just that you draw things on top of another. I mean, you have to to connect them in a way in, the, in which they truly act hierarchically. So the function of one depends on the function of the other, which depends on the function of the other. So any change in a particular way has to be, in a particular level, has to be well integrated. And it would be beneficial to the other layers of the architecture. And that's it. Thanks. Yes. So in a continuously adaptive scenario. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that and, was and, and maybe not with a discrete queue, but something continuous also. Yes, yes, yes. So that's a very good question because I, it's something I, I forgot to highlight. So that we, we use this repetitive structure, like trial by trial and discrete time, is it's not just because the architecture can only do this. It's just because it's a way to analyze the behavior. No, it's it's a way in which we could formally analyze the behavior well, and it's also in line to how people in, in experimental neuroscience study learning, so in trial by trial tasks. But the only thing you have to do is to make the, so to put a link in there, a link here that, it's, that is uh, 
say that this signal is dependent on the state of the plant, not on time, but of the state of the plant, then now it's, it's just uh, uh, something that can work in continuous time and uh, you don't need uh, to have trial by trial structure. So a better answer. Feedback error learning, okay, is proposed as a, in robotics as a control strategy for, 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 for whatever tasks. So it's not for repetitive tasks, it's for tasks in which, but the inputs to the cerebellum in feedback error learning depend on the state of the robot, not on time, okay? So the way I have uh, present feedback error learning here in this trial by trial, the structure is not the way you will find it in the literature, okay? It's just a, a way of studying feedback error learning. So at the end of the day, what I want to say is that uh, there's nothing in the control algorithm in the architecture that it's a specific of discrete time trial by trial, okay? It just depends on how you, which inputs you send to the cerebellum. If the inputs in the, you send to the cerebellum are trial dependent, it's a trial by trial system. If they are state dependent, they're a continuous system in which you can, instance, can learn uh, stabilization, which is something that will go continuously. It's not a trial by trial thing. Okay. So um, in your abstract, you were mentioning uh, cognitive control. Uh -huh. Yeah, so because I didn't get to the... So the point is that the, the, the latest thing that we have done here, which I'm not, is this thing that we're presenting in NIPS, is is find a solution to this. So what I have shown you is assume that you have this architecture and assume that you, there, you are using a particular learning rule. Okay, what's going to happen? Okay, and we study what's going to happen. But there was another possibility to, to, to face this problem is assume you have this architecture and assume you have this goal and the goal is to minimize error, no? Then which is the way to learn? And here we have like find that it's, it, it's quite direct to find which is the way to learn. You just have to use a model of the system that you are controlling, okay? So somehow, uh, what we, we have found is that uh, uh, the cerebellum, the way the cerebellum has to learn to control, so the, the optimal way for the cerebellum to control is to include in itself a model of the thing that it is controlling. Okay, at each synapse it should include a model of the thing that is controller or an approximated model. And if you do this in this architecture, you, you have somehow solved the problem. Okay, and you have solved the problem from a control theory perspective. So you know at each time step how you should change the information of the cerebellum such that you are learning in the best way possible. Okay, so what does it now the cerebellum in humans is mostly connected to uh, prefrontal area, uh, frontal areas of the brain. So it's not involved directly in motor control. It's interacting with structures that do planning, that do uh, I don't know, other cognitive tasks. So then what are the dynamics of a cognitive task? So the, the dynamics of the motor control task are given by the plan, so are by the physical uh, things that you are controlling and by the responses of the neurons that control these plants. But where I find that this is interesting because maybe here what you need is the dynamics of the neuro neuronal populations that you are controlling, okay? And, uh, and I think this is a completely open, so the point is, imagine you take this as a way to solve this system for motor control. Okay, now the same algorithm should be applicable when the cerebellum is not dealing with motor control but with cognitive, uh, improving cognition, okay? Making you taking automatic decisions or whatever it might do, the cerebellum, okay? Uh, what, what is going to be this? So what, what's going to be the meaning of this, uh, of this signal that that it's the one controlling plasticity and okay. That in the cerebellum, uh, we have the, the hypothesis that this is the calcium signal in the synapses that gets plasticity. So it's like, I think there is some information that we can get from this solution, uh, some, some insight that we might use in, in the reverse order, okay.
to us. No, there's another interesting element to this because if you say, look, the model must be in the synapse of the parallel fiber, <coughs> if they in turn are <coughs> receiving information from prefrontal, prefrontal maintains the most complex models that you can operate on. Right? Yeah. So in that sense, th this might be actually fitting that model, that you don't literally have the model in the synapse, but it is conveying a complex model from prefrontal cortex. But now on the other hand, maybe you also, you have some hidden parameters in your model that you, that you haven't really identified or declared to us, right? So for instance, in, in your case, you, you, you do have to parametrically control the shifting that you will, that you will allow yeah. in your signal. Yeah. Or you also have to control with how many let's say, what's the maximum number of steps you want to tolerate? Because in your case, you go from, the only thing right now, from the default level, you can only, let's say, reduce latency, right? At least in the examples you gave us. So these are additional now parameters you have to control that the, the error-based learning models might not face, right? You, you might face somewhat different problems now yeah. in your, in your, in your uh, control model. So can you... How, how are you going to now deal with these additional parameters? Because I think this might be another important difference with the Kawato model. No, um, if you use the Kawato model, you use the same learning algorithm, so you, you, should, you will have the same parameters. Mm -hmm. So when, there, when the parameters are not there, it means that this model will fail in controlling some systems, mm -hmm. in which is necessary to adjust this parameter. It's not always necessary. For instance, if you apply this system, if you apply this control algorithm with a self-balancing robot, you need, you need to, sh to anticipate, otherwise it will never work. For other systems, you don't have to, okay? But in the case of the surveillance robot, uh, they have some ugly property that before moving forward, they have to move backward, okay? So that they can tilt and then move forward, okay? So if you say the robot, uh, a surveillance robot, uh, go from zero to positive, it first have to go negative. So this means that uh, you need anticipation. So if you take a system without anticipation, it will fail in here, okay? You, not, you have to put the, this anticipatory thing. This, anticipa this, uh, this anticipation, it's, it's the system identification problem. So you have to know about the system you are controlling, okay? Here, when you do the, the optimal thing, it tells you the way to go optimal is to know exactly the thing you are controlling. In the case, you have the shift, and it's also the, the result from Shatmer. What you have to know is, more or less how much you have to anticipate. Not exact, the exact shape of everything, of the responses, but you have to know the latencies of the response of the system. Okay. And maybe there's another thing actually you solve with your model, because remember there was always this conundrum in, in the discussion on cerebellum, that if you go to, let's say, electric fish, right, electric fish have this incredible acuity in, in detecting perturbations in these electric fields they generate. Right, with sort of sub-millisecond precision. It's completely incredible. So, and they, they get this incredible fidelity by first making sure that all the axons from the lateral line on their body are exactly equal length, length but they feed the cerebellar-like structure. So they believe there the cerebellum is used for this very high resolution de detection and processing of sensory signals. So then the, the conundrum was, oh, but how could that be the same structure as motor control? because there we have error feedback and this mm. is a completely different system. But in some sense, you make sense of this now, because all you are manipulating is in the end a sensory signal. Yes, yes. Right? That's so exact. you solve, I think, a very fundamental contradiction in this literature on the cerebellum, and now we can see sort of a continuous trajectory also in the, the phylogeny of, of cerebellar structures. Yeah? Yes. No, exactly. So just, so if you look at, for instance, this book that we have used as, ex as, as example, and you read about the cerebellum, it's going to tell you Motor control. Uh, cerebellum is really important for motor control. And, uh, but by the time of this book, also there, there, there was literature where they were saying, no, it's not motor control, it's sensory estimation. But sensory estimation that it's necessary for motor control. And we are just going completely into that direction. It's sensory estimation that you do for motor control. Yeah. All right, on that note, uh, let's thank again Ivan and Jose for their wonderful presentations. And, and for those of you not initiated in this domain of motor control, might all sound a bit nerdy and, and difficult to get your head around. And indeed, it, it needs some, some sort of repetition and multiple exposures. But I think the, the way even I brought it to a very comprehensive you know, view and also c computational model of the cerebellum is a massive step forward. So 
hassle him if it's unclear to you. He has to make it clear to you. He owes that to you as his audience. Okay, so just hassle him. Anna, do we have other comments or, or remarks or? Uh, so yes, just an update on the projects. Check the web page. There will be a few more projects. Someone has seen it already. Who hasn't replied yet to for the project choice? Oi, do it today before lunch. So, well, send um, the information uh, to the contact person of uh, the project of your uh, choice and CC me. Yeah? Okay, so I have it directly. So by tomorrow, we have all the students assigned. It's important, otherwise we don't get out of here with the performance. Then another announcement, a little change in the program. If you check the program, uh, we will have a dinner tomorrow, a barbecue. But uh, some have requested to move it to Friday because they want to drink a lot. So they want to sleep on Sunday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, so we managed to do that. So you were very lucky. We were very lucky. And so the barbecue is on Friday. Yeah? Is that better? Yes. Everybody say yes. Wow. Yeah. We're drinking every day. They say, <laughs> doesn't matter. Okay, let's go for lunch. <laughs>